Hey, welcome back to Speed and Shine. I got a story here to tell. It's going to take a few videos, but I'm going to title it A Cautionary Tale. So a friend of mine who's a car collector and I um, went through some projects last year and there was a lot of work involved. And it all started a long time ago when we sat in a tavern having lunch and a commercial came on about Barrett Jackson's Scottsdale auction. Now, I've been a fan of Barrett Jackson's Scottsdale auction, watched it on TV since they've televised it. It's a big day for me. Um, I usually have certain things to eat and I sit in front of the TV and watch those beautiful cars be auctioned off. He had never heard of it before. So I described to him what it was and he seemed interested. A few weeks later, he called and informed me that him and his wife were going out there to bid on some cars. And he got a catalog in preparation of what was going to be sold. And he went through the catalog and he picked out some that he was interested in. So him and I went through those. We looked at the, you know, the estimated um, sale price that they would probably go for versus what he was willing to pay and what they were and what their value was. And um, he went out there and he bid on some cars. Now, initially, there was one car he really wanted, was a fresh street rod build. Um, it was beautiful, but uh, he had a set limit for that car, and it went over that limit, so he didn't purchase it. I felt, you know, really bad for him because I was texting with him live when this was happening, and I knew that he was disappointed. Well, a few days later, he calls me and says, hey, I didn't get that car, but I bought four more. So he bought four cars. So he purchased four cars. And those were some great cars. One was a 1938 Chevy uh, Master Deluxe, had a 350 engine, 350 trans, really nice leather um, interior, um, four wheel disc brakes. It was low to the ground, had a great stance. It was black. It was a awesome car. He also purchased a 1934 Chevy Roadster. This was a convertible. Um, it was white with a cream color at the top, so we called it the cream sickle car. It had a chromed out 350 fuel injected ramjet engine. The hole underneath the car was bullet aluminum and chrome. This car rumbled. It sounded so great. It looked fantastic. Um, he also purchased a 1948 Oldsmobile Coupe. This car had, you know, shaved door handles on it, um, you know, uh, low rider kind of style in a way, but it looked beautiful. It had a 350 Chevy engine in it. Um, it had modern conveniences like a new stereo, had air conditioning, tilt wheel. It was a true cruiser. There also was a 1948 Ford Deluxe Coupe flathead in it. Wasn't the original flathead, had a newer interior in it. It would be a great driver. They were all really, really great cars, although they had a lot of uh, issues that he had to contend with once he got them back and he took delivery with them to make sure that he was able to drive those on a regular basis and enjoy them. Um, he found that often while he fixed something on one car while the other car sat or vice versa and he'd go out and drive it more problems would occur and you know sometimes that happens um, if you don't drive a car enough. In the meantime he acquired a 2007 uh, ZR1 Corvette um, LS2 engine, beautiful car. Um, he purchased it in Florida, had it shipped to Michigan, and he didn't, he didn't drive it, I don't think, but maybe a couple times. And so now he wanted me to help him get these cars started and get them cleaned up and sell them. Along with a couple, he had two BSA motorcycles and a Triumph he wanted to sell as well. Now, I don't know a whole lot about bikes, but I knew that we had showed um, another collector who collects cars and bikes uh, those motorcycles some time ago and he had some interest in them. So I was just going to call him up and see if he'd want to buy those. As far as the cars go, um, we talked about different ways to do that. Um, we talked about selling them through a broker and we researched the brokers here in Michigan. Um, different companies do that and how they handle it. And we end up selling for Grand Rapids Auto Gallery. Now, Grand Rapids Auto Gallery is pretty unique, does a lot, you know, similar stuff that other ones do, but they seem to have really great reviews and they made it really easy. So they come out, um, they pick up the vehicles, they help you get them transported. They have professional detailing and photography services. 
Um, they handle all the sales, talking with the customers, and you negotiate a price, and when the car is sold, you send in your title, they send you back a check, and it's done. So, funny story. When I was over there at the car barn, uh, getting the cars ready, it was at night, so it was after my day job, and it was in the evening. Um, the only person who knew I was there really was my wife. Um, and I'm working on these cars and getting them, the batteries charged, getting them running, getting them cleaned up so that we could ship them off to be sold. The Corvette had an interesting problem. And I had charged the battery for quite a while. Um, and I got in the car and I tried to start it. Well, I shut the door. I couldn't leave the door open because they were kind of packed in. They were kind of tight. And when I did that, the windows were up to a certain point, but not down all the way. Um, the battery completely went flat, dead, boom. And um, the door's locked, which was kind of interesting. Um, I couldn't get out. I couldn't unlock the doors to get out. I know that sounds weird. Um, it was kind of strange at first. And I thought, well, this is kind of funny. So I tried to open the doors. I tried to do everything I could. And I thought, I might have to call somebody. Um, to come help me. And then I realized as I looked, I could see my phone over on the bench. So I didn't even have a cell phone on me. Well, after a few minutes of uh, laughing at myself and thinking about the predicament, you know, I have to go to the bathroom soon. And even if I'm here overnight, sooner or later, my wife's gonna call and tell somebody that, hey, her husband hasn't come home, go, go see if he's okay over at that car barn. I decided to open up the glove box and luckily the owner's manual was there and I read inside there that behind the driver you can get back there and there's a, a lever that you can pull that will manually unlock the doors. And it took quite a bit for this fat guy to get back there and do it, but I was able to save myself. So that Corvette and me just didn't get along very well. We ended up solving the problem. I took the battery home, charged it overnight, got a good charge, tightened that. Uh, the clamps on that and uh, got that thing running and it was a great car as well. So after a few months, those cars sold and I was able to contact that collector who was interested and he bought the two BSA motorcycles and the Triumph. I thought I was done. Hey, it all worked out for the best. My friend's happy. Everybody got some cool rides, although I really do miss that creamsicle car. If I could have had it you know, in my budget to purchase that, I would have purchased that. It was, it was just a fantastic car, the way it felt when you drove in it, the rumble, the way it looked, it was just great. Flash forward to a couple months later. I'm on a Saturday, I'm eating my lunch, taking a break from working on the Maverick here, and I'm sitting in front of the TV and I'm watching the Mecham auction at the Muscle Car City uh, auction in Punta Gorda, Florida. And I'm enjoying it, and I get a text, and it's from that collector. And he says to me, hey, guess where I am? I said, I have no idea, I know you're in Florida, but where are you? And he then sends me back a video of him at that auction and my heart sunk because I thought he's going to buy some cars and of course he told me I'm going to buy some cars so we talked briefly by text what those cars were um, he ended up buying two cars and because he was in Florida he asked me to handle the delivery of the cars and um, you know the inspection of the cars when they come it kind of made me nervous because the more that I researched about this muscle car city, I realized they tried to get the best of the best of big block cars, mostly Chevys and stuff, but it's a museum. Those cars have been sitting. I mean, that's almost worse than a regular auction car because you really don't know what you're going to get. It's buyer beware, but um, with a museum, I'm always wondering, you know, how much did they do to them um, to get them ready for display? Do they have fluids in them? Are they taken out and run? Are they driven regularly? I don't know. According to some of the videos I saw, they do get driven occasionally and get started up and ran, but they were really crammed in there, so I'm not sure how much that happened. So the day came. 
Cars were going to be delivered. I met the cars over at the car collector's uh, car barn, and we unloaded those two beautiful cars and put them in there and decided what to do next. We've done a lot of research, and we did come up with a place that we were going to take them to and have the cars uh, completely gone through from top to bottom and figure out you know, what's wrong with them, what needs to be done, and make them roadworthy. Because one thing the collector wanted is he wanted those cars to be ready to drive at a moment's notice. He could just get in and drive that car and enjoy it. So it was going to take some effort. Um, of course, you know, any guy who took delivery of those two things would just want to go out and, and drive it. Well, it's spring and you can hear the birds outside chirping and I'm really excited. I'm helping a private collector who wanted to change up his collection a little bit. And a few months ago, we went and got some cars started and had them transported to a muscle car or, you know, someone who specializes in classic car broker here in Michigan and they've been selling those cars. In the meantime, he went to uh, Muscle Car City in Punta Gorta. Meekum held a huge auction. The owner of the collection has decided that he wanted to travel and he wanted to sell his collection. Um, they are some of the finest examples of, most of them were Chevys uh, that were made. They're very rare cars. And what's really cool is I get to help him with this project. I have two of them here today, a 71 Cutlass and a 69 Nova that are from that collection. They were transported to Michigan. Um, I helped unload them. We pushed them in here. They don't run, of course. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done to get them running. You can't just, you know, I know what you're thinking, same thing I'm thinking, let's put some gas in and go bang some gears. Well, you just can't do that with a car that's been sitting in a museum for who knows how long. It may have been 10, 15, 20 years since they've been run. So there's some work that's got to be done on that. And we're going to transport those over to its minor customs here in Michigan. And they're going to go through the cars, do a inspection from the gas tank, to all the uh, wiring to make sure everything works, check the carburetors out, uh, make sure they're not, you know, the gaskets aren't dry rotted, change all the fluids, make sure that the cars are operable so that the collector can get them at any time, start them up and go drive and enjoy them. And we're gonna follow along the way and we're gonna see what, how this all progresses. And in the end, we're gonna go for a ride in these fantastic cars that he purchased and they are really awesome. So according to the sticker, the Mecham sticker, uh, this is a 1969 Chevrolet Nova SS. It is a 396, 375 horsepower, four speed. It has an L78 396 V8 engine. Uh, it is the correct Dover white exterior. It has a medium blue bench seat. It has an AM radio, power brakes, uh, the color key, styled wheels for that time, small hubcaps, the red line tires. It's a California car, it has the original protecto plate, has the original owner's manual and sales brochure, and a copy of the California pink slip. And he has some photos here uh, prior to the restoration. It is a awesome car. Um, it presents well under the hood, just needs to be detailed. Um, and cleaned up. I think this is going to make a great driver uh, to go get ice cream, go to those local cars and coffee. It's certainly going to get people talking. It's one of the finest examples of a Nova that I've ever seen. So this is a convertible Cutlass, which makes it even better. Make them tag on this one says 71 Oldsmobile 442 convertible, 455. Uh, W25 hood, Ram air induction, Four-speed manual transmission, rally red exterior with black stripes, power operated convertible top, black strato bucket seats with console, factory air condition, AM FM radio, remote driver mirror, rear spoiler, and power brakes. And can you imagine driving this on a nice warm day with the top down, the sun in your face and the wind in your hair and with all that horsepower? What a fantastic car.
Now that seems like quite a story, but that's not all of it. So now that we got the cars over to its minor customs is where the real story begins and some of the real challenges come and some of the things that make you think about where you purchase a car and how you purchase it. So stay tuned for part two of A Cautionary Tale.